Dr. Vincent Intandi, the coordinator for history and political science and an associate professor of history at the Tacoma Park Silver Spring campus. He holds a BA in economics from SUNY Potsdam in 1997, an MA in history from SUNY Oswego in 2003, and a PhD in history from American University 2009. His research interests include African American history, 20th century United States history, social history, and nuclear studies. Vincent is the director of research for the American University's Nuclear Studies Institute and has proposed the Center for Black Studies at Montgomery College. His articles frequently appear in the Huffington Post, and he is an author of what I think is a very important book, African Americans Against the Bomb, Nuclear Weapons, Colonialism, and the Black Freedom Movement, uh, published by Stanford Unity Press. Um, Vincent? Thank you. Okay, so uh, I think we're good. Okay. Cool. Um, thank you. Thanks for being here. It's nice to see everybody dry and our clothes all dry after yesterday. Um, thinking about what I want to talk about today, um, and all the work that I do in DC, and at the same time, I wear multiple hats. So I'm directing a new institute for race and justice at my school. I work with UCS, Peace Action, and, and so on and so forth. And one thing that always comes up is the word intersectionality. This has now become kind of the buzzword in a lot of these movements of how things are interrelated. And that, in a sense, is even how this book came about in my own career. For so long in my own career, my life revolved around civil rights, the black freedom movement, uh, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, atomic weapons, nuclear disarmament really wasn't on my radar until 2005 when I first went to Hiroshima and Nagasaki, meeting with atomic bomb survivors, especially Koko Kondo, um, Koko Tenemoto Kondo, hit me so hard that I then knew I had to combine these two passions of mine, eliminating racism and eliminating nuclear weapons, and that's what led to this research uh, in this book. And I say that because the idea of intersectionality or movements being interrelated is not new. Um, and this was especially the case in the black community. When the atomic bomb was dropped in Hiroshima and then in Nagasaki, many in the black community, of course nothing's monolithic, but many in the black community immediately came out and connected the issue of nuclear weapons to their own struggle for freedom and equality, to race, to colonialism, to economics. In fact, it was Langston Hughes, who in 1945, the great black poet and writer, who was one of the first in our country to come out and question Truman's own racism in the decision to use nuclear weapons. And of course, he was right to do so. Truman isn't the most racist president. We probably have that now, but one of the most racist presidents in US history. Um, the great Paul Robeson, who so many of, our, of my students have no idea who he is, it's tragic, but Paul Robeson, a year after the atomic bomb was dropped in Madison Square Garden speaking to 20,000 people, he was one of the first to come out and tie this issue to colonialism, asking the question of where did the United States get our uranium to make nuclear weapons? And the answer, of course, was the Belgian-controlled Congo and Africa. W.E.B. Du Bois, who had by then already was lionized in Japan, uh, was also a vehement critic of Truman's decision. And a lot of the early critiques that we see in the black community was because there was a connection with the non-white world, something very important because we're lacking that in many cases today. That in many in the black community, they identified with the Japanese. They identified with non-white people around the world. Remember, it was the Japanese who came out publicly and said they were going to come to Ethiopia's aid when Mussolini said he was going to invade and the U.S. was going to do nothing. There were many in the black community that saw Japanese internment in this country and said, here's a group of people that committed no crime but were being put in concentration camps simply because of the color of their skin. This could happen to us. So part of this was already built in before the atomic bomb even happened. When there was the hydrogen bomb in 1952 created and there were threats of using it um, in Korea, again in the black community, they were looking at this saying, no, we are not going to let another Hiroshima happen to non-white peoples around the world. We see it again in the 1960s, of course, when we repeatedly threatened to use nuclear weapons in Vietnam, again, non-white peoples. And in the 1950s, uh, there's so many things happening at the same time where you can see these connections happening especially in a pivotal year like 1955, 
where in the summer you have the heinous murder of Emmett Till. A few months later, in December, Rosa Parks refuses to give up her seat on the bus. But in that same year, we had the Bandung Conference in Indonesia, the first all African Asian conference. And if you look at that platform, they were very clear that they were against white supremacy, colonialism, and nuclear weapons. At the same time, in the late 1950s, we see the French government wanting to be a world power and announcing they were going to test their first nuclear weapon where? In Africa, in the Sahara. You have uh, Algeria going through the revolutionary movement. You have Ghana and Nkrumah gaining independence. And the people in Ghana worried about the nuclear fallout from that French test. So who was it that put that together and started that movement to try to stop the French? It was Bayard Rustin. Rustin, who had such a long body of activism in this country dating back to the 30s, another person forgotten, marginalized because he was gay. In the 1960s, it was not just Vietnam, but we of course see Martin Luther King Jr. and all of his statements as triple evils connecting these issues. And where did he learn so much of this from? His wife, of course, Coretta, a long season activist dating back to her days at Antioch College. It was King who was saying, what does it matter if we're integrating lunch counters and then not caring about the world in which we're trying to integrate? Don't you see how these things are connected? And of course, this lasts into the 70s and the 80s. And I'm a historian that doesn't believe in just studying history and leaving it in the past. What, what good is that? If you're not going to study it and see how it can apply today, how can it reach students today? So the new book I'm writing now is on the June 12, 1982 march. How? How did we get one million people together without a cell phone, without social media? What was done right? What was done wrong? How did they organize? How did this happen? And as I'm doing the research now in the interviews, I'm seeing some of the same themes that are happening, some of the same problems that happen today. We, we saw that they had to fight back then. And this issue of intersectionality was there. Yes, there were some that said it should be a single issue. We should only focus on nuclear disarmament. But there were others, many others, including some in this very room that said, how? How, when we look at the issue in Lebanon right now, when we look at the Reagan administration killing 75,000 in El Salvador with death squads, how can we not tie this together with what is happening with nuclear weapons? These issues are indeed connected. Now, one thing of the reason I wrote the, the first book was because right now, where I teach at Montgomery College, um, we're one of the most diverse schools in the country. And half of my, in my classes, about 50% of my students are from all various parts of Africa, Ghana, Ethiopia, Nigeria. 49% are African American from the DC area, 1% other. And what I see is a huge disconnect between my African and African American students. My African students tell me that when they come here, they are taught not to associate with African Americans, that they are lazy, they droop their pants, they're not one of you. My African American students will say, I'm not from Africa, I'm from Anacostia, I'm from Shaw, I'm from Southeast DC. And trying to explain to them when the cops killed Philando Castile, they didn't stop first and say, are you from Anacostia, Nigeria? They killed him because he was black. And how these things are related. And we're starting to see that in certain aspects, right? We're starting to see now Black Lives Matter activists standing at Standing Rock. We're starting to see them stand with one another with Palestine or with Dreamers. But still nuclear disarmament isn't there. Still peace is not there. It's, it's like the, the stepchild, the person left out of intersectionality. And why is that? What is it that we should be doing better? What can we do better? And that's what I'm looking at more and more today in this research and working um, with, with students today, working whether it's with Black Lives Matter or with peace groups and nuclear disarmament. And we have to be honest with ourselves, you know, being in D.C., I'm, I'm privy to a lot of the problems that we saw back in the 80s and that we still see and are some ways worse today. And what I mean by that is there's a real disconnect right now between arms control and nuclear disarmament. We have to be honest, there's some people in the arms control movement that have a nice paycheck right now, and it's not in their best interest for us to have nuclear disarmament. And the tragedy is they're the ones that have the purse strings. They're the ones that have the money. And in many cases, it intersects with patriarchy. We have to be honest with ourselves that in a lot of this movement, there is still dominated by white men. And women are still fighting for a seat at the table. People of color are still fighting for a seat at the table, and most of all, millennials are fighting for a seat at that table. I am amazed every day at what somebody like Kate Alexander does for peace action on a shoestring budget. 
Imagine what she would do if she had the money that some of these larger think tanks have to really organize students. This young female just came up here from Tufts. Imagine what she could do with real resources. This is something that we have to address and we have to look at. We have to think about how can we reach these groups? How do we build coalitions of Black Lives Matter? Half of the battle is just showing up, just listening, right? And if they see that we're constantly there, then they'll be there for us, seeing how these things are interconnected. You know, the first book I wrote is because I'm hoping that if white peace activists that didn't know African Americans were interested in this pick up my book, they'll see the connections and vice versa. That my African American students, when they'll see that Huey Newton and Angela Davis and Malcolm and so many others that they look up to actually cared about nuclear weapons, they'll get invested in it. And so, you know, in closing, yes, we are fighting on a lot of fronts, and that's a problem for a lot of my students. They're trying to put food on the table, pay student loans, hope to God they don't get killed by the police on the way home from school. And to them, nuclear weapons is still abstract. They've grown up with war. They were three, two years old when 9-11 happened. They don't know a world without it. And so they're just trying to survive. And so we have to work to see how can we get them to care about this issue. Is it that we need to rebrand peace, right? Um, and make them realize that peace isn't weak? Do we have to show how it's connected, nuclear testing and environmental racism? These are the questions we have to ask ourselves. And so in closing is, yes, we have to fight for LGBT rights, we have to fight for women's rights, we have to fight for Black Lives Matter, for Native Americans. But as Dr. King said, what does it matter if we achieve social justice if we're all dead from nuclear war? And now, now is, the, now is when we capitalize it, not just because of nuclear ban, but because we have two people right now, two racists, two white nationalist authoritarians with 90% of the world's nuclear weapons in Putin and in Trump. There is no, and then you have over 130 countries that are mostly non-white in the UN trying to ban the bomb. There's no bigger connection of race and nuclear weapons than right now. And so we need to do, thank you. And so let me just say that when we step back and we look at intersectionality and we look at all of these movements, we'll realize how so many people before us did, most notably Malcolm X who probably understood it best. That for all of us and all of these different movements, the issue is, was, and remains truly so that all of us have universal human rights. Thank you.